there's one over here too. Doesn't want to leave. Finally, it feels like spring is here. It's warm and flowers are coming out. Looking forward to maybe doing some outings later on in the year, maybe going to the park, uh, going on some trips. Uh, for those of you who are wondering about our small group ministry, uh, we haven't had a small group ministry in a while, actually. Uh, but if you've been wondering, we are uh, in the works of preparing for that. So uh, hopefully within uh, the next few weeks, we'll have a registration set up and we'll have small groups set up again. So uh, once we have that figured out, we will announce that to you all. Why don't we pray together and we'll get started with our message. Let's pray. Lord, we just invite you to speak to us at this time. We pray that our hearts would be humble, that our hearts would be soft before you. God, we know that your word is true and we know that your word has power. So we just pray, may your word transform us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So this psalm that we just read today is about worship. A lot of people, they, they say that this psalm, Psalm 95, is the classic psalm on worship. So reading this psalm should give us some idea about what worship is, why we should worship, how we should worship. Uh, if you have questions about worship, this is where you want, to, you want to look at this song. So let's start by looking at what worship is. Uh, I'm just going to give you a basic definition of worship. Uh, worship is the act of valuing something or someone as the most valuable thing or person in your life. And you do that by using all of your energy and all of your being. So that is a worship. Worship is the act of valuing something or someone as the most valuable person or thing in your life, using all of your energy and all of your being. This is, this is worship. So believing that your career is valuable is not worship. We can believe that our career is valuable. We can believe that our family is valuable. But believing that your career is the highest good in your life, that all other things are lesser than that, lesser priorities, then that is worship. Right? So valuing your career, valuing your family, valuing money, valuing enjoyment and pleasure, all those things are good and fine. But taking those things and making them the highest good and using all of your energy and being to promote that, that is worship. So this means, you know, whether, we're not, whether or not we're talking about Christian or non-Christian, whether we're in a church or whether we're at the workplace, all people worship. Doesn't matter if we're talking about secular or spiritual, because we all have something or someone that we have made our highest good. We all have it. Doesn't matter if you say you're spiritual or not. We all have it. Everyone has that. So everyone is a worshiper. Everyone. So worship is not just for religious people. Uh, worship is just what human beings do. We are automatically wired to find something to make our highest good. That is what we will always do. We will always fill that spot with something. So the Bible then is trying to show us how this very human thing called worship, this thing that all human beings do, how it's supposed to work, uh, is trying to show us uh, what it is about worship that we should know. So what it produced was is we were built to function properly only when we worship God. That is how we were wired. The only way that as human beings we function 100% correctly is when our worship, the thing that is our highest good and highest priority in life, 
is God. And if our worship is of any other thing, even good things like family, or your career, or your friends, or your reputation, any good thing you place up there in the high spot, you will malfunction. Something will go wrong in you. So to sum it up, uh, if we look at it this way, then worship is really not so much about what you say is your highest good, right? We, we tend to think that worship is what we sing, right? Because we, we call this worship, and we sing these songs, we call them worship songs. So we tend to equate worship with what we say, but actually worship is more about your behavior. Worship is not so much about what you say. What you say is also important, but how you behave really shows what you worship. So we have to look at our actions. We have to look at the choices we make in this life. So worship, just to make it clear once again, worship does not equal singing. Uh, worship does not equal a church service. You have to know this. That is not the definition of worship. You can worship through singing. You can use singing to worship. You can use a worship service to worship. But you can also worship by making choices in your life. By saying, my career is the most important thing in my life. That's worship. By making choices where you elevate your family above every other thing in your life. That's worship. You are worshiping your family. You may not be in church, but you are worshiping. <clears throat> so worship, worship happens anytime you say, I may have God as a Christian. You may say, I may have God, but I'm nothing without my career. That's worship. It's idolatry. If a Christian says, I may have God, but I'm nothing without my beauty. That's worship. I may have God, but I'm nothing without my, my family or my relationships. And that is worship. It's idolatry. So while worship does not equal singing, uh, Scripture does tell us, though, that one of the main ways we should worship is through singing, is through song and music. So verse 1 of our song today, it says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. But this is about singing, this is about music. So whether you look in the Old Testament or whether you look in the New Testament, many, many times, you'll see it all over the Bible, God is constantly putting worship and music together. Right? It is, it is all over the Bible. If you read through the Bible, there are so many places where you see that connection, worship and music. God is always making that link. And verse 3 tells us why we should sing and why we should make a joyful noise. And I want you to pay attention to the word in the very beginning, which is for, which means this is why. And he says, for the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. So this is the reason. Uh, why do we worship? For he is a great God and he is above all other gods. Now, I want us to think about all the reasons that we might have for not singing when we worship. Have you ever said this? Have you ever said, you know, in a worship service, have you ever said, well, this isn't my style of, of music? Have you ever said, well, I'm not a fan of this song. I don't really like this song. Have you ever said, well, this music isn't polished enough, you know, I'm not, I don't really think that their, their singing is really bothering me, right? They're not, they're not up to my level. Have you ever said, I'm not really comfortable with this environment, I'm not really comfortable with the people, I'm not really comfortable with the size of this church. I don't know about you, but I said all of those things. I mean, I'm pretty sure if you are a Christian uh, and you have been in a worship service, you have probably said one or more of these things. I've said all of these things. I've thought all of those things as I was in a worship service and I did not sing. We all have reasons. 
But when you look at scripture, it only gives one reason for singing. We sing because God is great. That's just one reason. That's it. Now, is God ever not great? No, He's always great. You might have the opinion that He's not that great. You might feel that He's not that great. Maybe you're struggling with God. Maybe you're angry with God. And you feel, well, God is not that great. Well, that's your opinion. But the fact is, God is still great. He is never not great. He is never not worthy of worship. So our songs only have one basis, which is who God is. And because who God is never changes, the reason for singing to God never stops. It's always there. There's always a reason to sing. Because God is always good. Because He is always great. Because He is always above all other gods. You know, when I got married, uh, some of you who are married here may have done this. I, I wrote wedding vows. And I know in Korea, uh, they don't always do wedding vows, but uh, I've heard that nowadays, uh, more and more young couples do wedding vows. Uh, but, uh, you know, when I, when I got married, we had two weddings, one in Korea and one in America. The one in Korea, I didn't, I didn't do vows. Uh, I didn't do anything. I just stood there. It was very, uh, I was just a prop, you know. <laughs> it was kind of strange. Um, but in, in America, the, the couple is very involved in the wedding. They, they, they're, they're involved in all the details. So I, I did a wedding vow. And, you know, when I was writing this wedding vow, all my focus was on making sure that I can express my heart to my wife. Right? I wanted to make sure that every word that I wrote uh, really was an accurate expression of how much I, I loved her, how much I wanted to be with her. So, you know, it was, it was something that I was really paying attention to. And when that moment came and I stood up on the, you know, stood up in front of everybody, what if, this is not what happened, but what if I stood up there and I said, I refuse to say these vows because this lighting is terrible. And you know what? I'm not a fan of the food today. This wedding food is terrible. Or you know what? I don't like the people here. Uh, I don't know who invited you. Or, you know, the wedding music. Oh, you know what? We should have gotten different wedding musicians. Uh, you know, I don't know. What if I just stood up there and I just started saying, I don't like this, I don't like that, I'm not a fan of this, and then I just refuse to say my vows while my wife stood in front of me. Now, let me make this very clear. Do all those things help the mood? Yes. Flowers, uh, tuxedos, suits, good food, good music. All of those things help, and they are important. Otherwise, why would we stress about that? We, it's important, you know. When you plan a wedding, you want everything to be as perfect as possible. And when you plan a worship service, you try to make everything as perfect as possible. Of course you want those things to help the mood. These things do matter. They should, should be as excellent as possible because it is an important event. But if I refuse to say my vows because of all those things not being the way I like, what would you think about me? Wouldn't that be the strangest wedding ever? You would look at you would look at me and say, there is something seriously wrong with that guy. How could he stand in front of his wife and be complaining about all these things? Doesn't he know that it's not about him, it's about his wife? You, you would say he's way too focused on other things. His focus is totally off. How could you complain on a, on a day like this? This is a day of celebration. You might even ask, does he really love her? Does he really love her? How can he ignore her and just point out everything else? When I was learning about worship music leading, uh, I read something about the different phases of worship. And it talks about the different uh, levels that people go through as they worship. And in the earlier phases, people will need songs that they're used to uh, because uh, you know they're not they're not comfortable. So you pick songs that are really easy, or you pick songs that everyone knows how to sing. Right? Those are songs you 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 have so that 
people can ease into worship, right? This is called the invitation phase. Uh, so, you know, if we made it, if we use a more a relational example, we could say this is like in a conversation, this is like the first few minutes of awkward conversation, right? It's like, you know, oh, where do you live? And you ask simple questions, you don't ask difficult questions, because there's that awkwardness, right? But as you go into worship, the last phase of worship is called visitation. And this is basically an encounter with God. This is when you meet God face to face. And it says, the, the, the teaching that I was reading, it says when, when people get here, when people get to this last phase, this visitation stage, it doesn't matter what you sing. It doesn't matter what songs you're singing. It doesn't matter if it's a hard song or an old song, a new song, a slow song. It doesn't matter. You can sing anything because God is real and God is near and people know it. And so they don't care about the songs. They don't care about the lyrics. They're just singing because they know God is present. I wonder how many times in, in, our, in our worship services we got to the visitation phase. Uh, I, I, I hope that at some point you've experienced that time when you really didn't care what we were singing. You didn't really care what songs were being up, what, what songs were up there. It didn't matter if it was a new song. You just, it's God's here. How can I ignore him? God is here and that is what makes me sing. Uh, but sometimes, you know, I do feel like my role as a worship leader is like trying to facilitate two people in a blind date. Right? It's like, okay, well, this is God, and uh, okay, this is so-and-so, and you know, you guys should meet, and you know, this, is a, this is gonna be nice, don't worry about it, you know, you have nothing to worry about, God is really good, and He, and he forgave you, and He loves you, and you know, sometimes I feel like as a worship leader, I have to like, pull the people like toward God and God, okay, okay, let's meet and let's have a conversation, let's let's enjoy each other. I feel like I have to break the ice, right? Like, okay, there's so much awkwardness between these people and God. You gotta like ease into this relationship. But I've also uh, at times I've led pastors in worship. Uh, I've had the opportunity to sometimes lead a group of pastors. Uh, now let me say this, I'm not saying pastors are perfect by any means. I'm not saying this to compare you to pastors. Uh, I just want to kind of illustrate my point. Uh, you know, one of the blessings and the curses of being a pastor is that I have to spend time with God. It's my job. So, you know, for you, it's, it's optional, right? Uh, it's, not, it's not tied to your profession. Uh, well, it should be. We're all in ministry. Uh, but for me as a pastor, uh, I have sermons to prepare, I have Bible studies to prepare, so I have to always be in contact with God. I'm always talking to Him in some way. I'm always reading about Him in some way. And so there's that constant communion. This is a blessing and a curse, right? Sometimes it can become tedious. But when I lead other pastors, there's no icebreaker usually. I don't need to give them easy songs. I don't need to ease them into it. It doesn't feel like I'm facilitating a blind date, right? It, it feels more like I'm joining in what they've already been doing with God. It, it feels more like I'm jumping into this excitement that they've already had with God. That's what it feels like. So again, I'm not sharing this with you so that you make a comparison and you feel guilty. I'm, I'm sharing this with you so that you have something to aim for. I, I don't know if you ever thought about worship this way, that maybe I should be in a place where uh, there is no ice breaking. Maybe that's something I should aim for. Maybe I should aim for, when I come to church, I'm already ready to get into worship. It, there's no, you don't need to keep me an easy song. You don't need to ease me in. I'm there, right? I'm 100% there because I know this guy. I know God. I know Jesus. We're already close. I've been talking with him all week. Right, I want that to be the aim, right, the goal for us as worshipers. So seek to become a worshiper who can worship at any moment to any song. That should be what we should aim for. Because your reason for worship is not your comfort. 
Your reason for worship is not your music preference. Your reason for worship is not the environment. Your reason for worship is just God, who He is. So you always have a reason to sing. So if you find it hard to sing, the questions that you should be asking are not, well, maybe this style isn't right for me. Or maybe these songs are just not the right songs for me. Or maybe this environment is not the right environment for me. Now, I'm not saying those questions are irrelevant. There is, you know, we should always try to be thinking about how to connect with people. But I think the more important question we should be asking is not those questions. Instead, we should be asking, what's wrong with my view of God? What's wrong with my view of God? Why is not God enough reason for me to sing? Why is it that the style is preventing me from singing to a God who is still great? Why is it that the environment is preventing me from singing to God when He's right here in front of me? What's wrong with my view? Is there some correction I need to make? Am I not seeing him clearly enough? Now my next point is something I, I touched on already. Uh, this is verse 2. Verse 2 says, Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Now how do you come into God's presence with thanksgiving. Well, if you're coming in with thanksgiving, that means you are already giving thanks before you came in. Right? It's, it doesn't say we came in and then we gave thanksgiving. It says we came in and let us come into the presence with thanksgiving as we are coming in. Right? So, it's, it's something that's been ongoing. <clears throat> what this means is worship doesn't begin on Sunday, and it doesn't end when this service is over. That is not what worship is. Worship should never stop. This is just one moment in worship during the week of worship. So worship was continuous. I wonder if this is true about your walk with God. Can you say that every day of your walk with God is worship? Can you say that when you come on Sunday, it's not the beginning of worship, right? Like, it's a cold start, like, okay, oh God, you know, I need to make up for all that I lost with you. All right, okay, Sunday's the day, right? It's our date night, okay? That's the one day that I'm gonna really be there for you. Or is it something that's been ongoing throughout the week? Now, I'll say I've been guilty of neglecting God too. And there have been times when I come into worship and it's a cold start. I feel awkward. I have to ease into worship. But we should aim for that continuous worship where there's no awkwardness when you come into the service. Uh, some of you remember that we did a campaign uh, on gratitude and thanksgiving and uh, some of you may, may remember that the, the challenge was every day we, we had to write down three things that we were thankful for. Uh, and we tried to share that with each other. And um, I don't know about you, but for me that was very powerful. Because uh, I tend to be a complainer, and I tend to look at the negative side of things. I, I'm not a very positive person by nature. I'm very critical. So this was very, very powerful for me. It was, it was very powerful worship. It, it was very powerful training for my mind to train my mind to see what God is doing, even when there are things that aren't going right in my life. You know, there's, there's a well-known moment in talk show history, in American talk show history. You all know who Oprah is, right? Oprah Winfrey. She's, she's world famous. I think she is the, the richest woman in the world, if not the richest, at least top five or top ten. But she is uh, you know, very, very famous, and she had this one moment that is probably the most famous moment in her talk show history, where she surprised every member of the audience with a brand new car. I don't know if you've ever seen that, uh, but she said, there's one person in this audience 
or I don't know about one, but she would say like one or a few have a key on their seat. So like everyone is excited. Oh, you know, like we, we have a, someone want a car, and this one of the people like wrote, they wrote the car, I, I want a car, right? And then another person, I want a car too. And then everyone was finding out that they all want a car. So then Oprah was like excited, and she was like, you get a car, and you get a car, and you get a car. And she was, jumping around and everyone was screaming and everyone was crying and it was just like this crazy, crazy moment in talk show history. And when you see that, right, what are you seeing? What are you seeing? You're seeing incredible, immense gratitude. They're so thankful because they receive something of incredible value, something that they didn't think they deserved. No one was thinking, I deserve a car today. No one was expecting it. And when that happens, right, when you get that surprise gift that of incredible value, you can't help but feel thankful. As Christians, our worship of God is centered on the gift of Jesus. I don't know, do you feel like you deserve Jesus? Is it, is it just like normal for you? Do we expect that Jesus will always be around? That gift of Jesus is to sacrifice his life. I wonder if we need to, to meditate more on the fact that we don't deserve him. That it is an incredibly undeserved, unexpected gift. God himself taking, his, taking the place on the cross instead of us, dying in our place, forgiving our sins, giving us what he deserved. God deserved the love of God. God deserved to live and to experience fullness. But Jesus on the cross, he got the penalty and we got the reward. We got eternal life. And we got the place next to God the Father while Jesus, he was made an object of shame. My, my question also is how how worthy of worship is Jesus to you? What is Jesus actually worth to you? What is the value of Jesus? If I told you that the value of the chair you are sitting on right now is worth one billion dollars, just hypothetical, let's say you find out that the chair you're sitting on is not just any, any ordinary chair, but it is actually worth a billion dollars. If you found out that that was true, would you still be sitting on it? Absolutely not. You would get up, you would jump up, you'd be like, oh my gosh, this is a billion dollars. Wouldn't your behavior suddenly change? Wouldn't maybe you were planning on going out to eat with your friends and then you know maybe like next week, you know, certain plan, I'm gonna do this and that. Wouldn't all your plans change? Everything would change. Your behavior would change in extreme ways if you found out that what you were sitting on is worth a billion dollars. You would no longer be thinking about what am I going to eat for dinner and what am I going to do next week. That's, that's no longer a concern. You wouldn't be thinking about those problems that you had this week. That would all go out the window. All your focus would be on how am I going to get this home safely? Right? How, how am I going to protect this? This is worth a billion dollars. This will change my life. If I can just hold on to this, and make sure that I can get this home and sell this to somebody, oh, then everything is different. Your whole focus will be on that chair. Right? You won't be thinking about anything else. True worship, whether it's through music, or meditation, or Bible study, or the choices that you make, will always change your life. If the thing you are worshiping is of incredible value, it cannot but change your life. A billion dollars will change your life. Why? Because it is incredibly valuable. If anything of that much value comes into your life, there is no way that your life does not change. It has to. No rational person can encounter Someone like God, such incredible value and beauty and greatness, and not radically change their life, their priorities, their day-to-day -day behavior. There is 
No way that you meet someone that amazing and beautiful and powerful and you say, all right, I'm just going to live my day the way I've always lived my day. No. It's impossible. My goal, every time we get together like this, as a formal gathering of the church to worship. Again, you know, I don't want to say this alone is worship. I want to say this is just a formal gathering where we gather as church to worship but we will continue to worship throughout the week. Right? This is just one moment of worship where we corporately worship. But every, every time we worship like this, my goal, my goal is to help you meet God. That's it. It's not to preach a good sermon. It's not to play good music. It's not to collect offering. Uh, it's not to do small group. None of that matters to me. My goal is to help you meet God. That's it. I know that if you meet him, you will change. It's, it's impossible for you to. If you meet him, you will change. You, you're not going to change listening to my words. But if God comes through my words, you will change. You're not going to change by just listening to nice Christian music. But if God comes to you through the Christian music, you will change. If you've ever asked, how can I change as a Christian? Uh, why am I not changing more as a Christian? The answer is worship. Worship is the answer. Worship is how you change. A lot of Christians I know, they try to change by doing things, right? Like, I'm going to read the Bible more, I'm going to pray more, or I'm going to do more Christian things. And I'm not, again, please don't misunderstand me. There's nothing wrong with that, and God can use all those things. But it is not Bible study by itself. It is not missions trips by themselves that will change you. Your outer behavior might change, but the only thing that changes you from the inside out is God. God is the only one who can change you. So this is true worship. True worship is when you, just like you, you, you find out, oh my gosh, this chair is worth a billion dollars, and everything in your life changes. That's what true worship is. It's, oh my gosh. This, this God is this beautiful and this amazing and this powerful, more amazing than I ever imagined, and then you begin celebrating Him as the greatest good in your life and reorienting everything in your life to make sure that that is always at your center. Just like if there's a billion dollars, all of your attention is on maximizing that billion dollars, maximizing the value, making sure that all of your time is invested in increasing that. So if God is that greatest value in your life, Everything is going to be connected to that. Everything is going to be in orientation to that, in relation to that. There is no decision you make that will be done without considering how that affects your greatest good. That is what should happen. That is true worship. It will dramatically change your life. Now I want to end with the last part of the song, which, uh, if you read it, it's it's dark. So the first half is very bright. The second half suddenly becomes dark. Verse 9 to 11, this is God speaking. He says, when your fathers, he's talking about the Israelites. He says, when, when your fathers, your, your, your parents, put me to the test. And this is talking about when the Israelite people were in the desert, wandering in the desert. When your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work, for 40 years I loathed, I hated that generation, and said, there are people who go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. I remember when I said that worship and thanksgiving go together. What is, what is it that God is upset with? What is it that God is rebuking them? What, what is it that made God really be disappointed in them? Verse 9 says, The Israelites, though they had seen God's work, they saw the work of God. They saw His miracles. They saw His faithfulness. They saw His presence. And they didn't value it. They didn't value it, they didn't appreciate it, they doubted, 
They complained. They dismissed it. They said, we want war. And the result is, they could not enter the contrast. And isn't that true? When we're not thankful, have you, we've all complained here. When you're complaining, do you feel at rest? No, it's, it's a terrible place to be. Complaining is stressful. Right? Being thankful is far more fun. When you're thankful, everything is brighter, everything is, is a gift. When you're not thankful, it is a stressful place to be. Have you ever, ever felt deeply satisfied by Jesus? What did you feel? What did you feel when Jesus was satisfying your deepest desires? I don't know about you, but I feel peace. I feel peace when Jesus satisfies me. Because I realize that Jesus is enough. And in the end, isn't that what we're all looking for? We're looking for peace. We're looking for peace. And the rest that Jesus gives is that peace when we make him the highest good. Now I want to end just by uh, making this simple statement just to wrap this up and that is uh, none of this is possible without the Holy Spirit. Uh, you cannot know God or encounter God or experience God without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who reveals God to you. I can't do it, you know. Some of you may think that I am the one who brings God to you. I cannot bring, I wish I could bring God to you. I cannot bring God to you. I can talk about God, I can, I can ask God to use me, but the Holy Spirit has to do it. So, part of our response for today, as we go into a time of ministry, uh, is to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal God to us so that we can worship Him, to reveal the value and worth of God, so that you begin to reorient your life around this highest good. Let's pray together and let's do that.